But right now, we want Brother Elms to come and take his liberty. Amen. And let, let, let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. Let's thank God for this man of God that has come into this pulpit. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's give that to the one that really deserves it right now. Come on, somebody, lift your voice and give God some praise. He's here. I said he's here. I said he's here. If you believe he's here, just thank the Lord right now for what you're feeling. I praise you, God. I worship you, God. I magnify your holy name. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, you can sit back down. Thank you for standing. We give all the honor to God and glory to Him. And we are so excited and happy and feel privileged and honored to be here with you tonight. And so glad to be with your pastor and pastor's wife. How many of you love and appreciate the man and woman of God? that he has blessed you with. Could we just take a moment for them? God bless brother and sister Garcia. That's right. Amen. Everybody say, I need a pastor. In truer words, were never spoken out of your mouth. Amen. Everybody needs a pastor. Every pastor needs a pastor. The Bible says it is so very important that we have a man of God that can lead us. You know, there's a lot of people in the world that can give us secular, good, I might add, secular advice on life and money and some counseling. Uh, but there's only one person that God gave when it came to a position that can help you, not on a secular level as much as on an eternal level. And that is your pastor. It's a calling that is above learning it's a calling that is above understanding it is something god calls a person to and you need to be thankful tonight that god has called brother garcia and sister garcia to be your pastor and pastor's wife let me just tell you the enemy is not the flesh the enemy is not our brothers and sisters the enemy is not our pastor and pastor's wife the enemy, let's put the enemy and let's focus on who the enemy really is here tonight. The enemy is the flesh and the enemy is the devil. If we would put our efforts into fighting those things and lifting up and honoring and thanking God for the ones that he's put into our life, we would see some miraculous things happen in our personal life. One more time, thank God for your pastor and your pastor's wife. Come on, he's your leader. He's your vision. He can see things you cannot see. Follow them. Amen, 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 amen. And thank you so much for honoring my wife. By the way, that's the first time that has ever happened. It doesn't mean that other churches don't care. It's just one of those extra special touches that that means so much and if it wasn't for her I, I i don't know i don't know where i would be if it wasn't for the lord i know i wouldn't be anywhere close to the pulpit amen but thank god for a wife and i'm thankful that i don't have to drag her around through ministry and my kids and say come on we gotta go it's church time we don't want to go we don't i don't have to do that they willingly come they want to pray they want to be a part i'm a blessed man tonight because God's blessed me with such a wonderful wife and family. 
It's like that man once said, uh, someone was pressuring him to do something and he said, they were saying, what kind, of a, what kind of a man are you? What kind of a husband are you? I thought you were the man of this house. He said, I am the man of this house and I'm going to do it just as soon as my wife gives me permission. <laughs> Amen. Time to be the man, men. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. It is just so good to be here. And, you know, those memories we made in the Philippines with Brother Fuquay and Brother and Sister Garcia are, like he said, memories we will always cherish together. I just wish I could have been there when the blinded eyes were open. At the church service, Brother Fuquay was preaching at. I've seen it happen, but I'd like to see it again. It's awesome. Amen. And then I, I just, oh, I should have just kept talking about your pastor because I have some more bragging to, to do about him. He was mightily used of God in a prison where 50 inmates were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And a man got up out of a chair who hadn't been able to walk in several weeks and walked about from me over to that pulpit and back. The beginning of that man's healing happened. And I'm just telling you, the Lord used your pastor and pastor's wife mightily. And you have every reason to be Holy Ghost proud of them. They represented you very well. And we're just so thankful that God brought us together. It took the Philippines for us to finally meet. And uh, I've, I've laughed about that. But man, what an awesome time we had. And the pictures, um, just amazing. I'll send you all the ones I've got in exchange for the ones you got. It's a deal. It's a deal. Amen. Praise the Lord. So just incredible to be here tonight. And I do feel like I have a word from the Lord for this service. And I just, you know, when I feel something, I like to test it out and say, God, I want to make sure that it's you, that I don't, that I don't just go off of emotion and, but I'm going to do something I don't normally do and say something that I've only felt one time before I preach. I'm just going to tell this church something and who knows, it may be over right here. I don't know. By the way, buddy, you were that close to receiving the Holy Ghost in that baptismal tank. And I'm just going to go ahead and claim you're going to get it tonight before you leave this place. Will you accept that in Jesus' name? The next time you lift your hands, let God take control of your tongue and you're going to begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance. Amen. But I felt it when I sat down in this chair up here and I leaned over and I told your pastor, I hope this is okay to say it. I'm just speaking by faith right now because that's what we're supposed to do. Speaking those things which are not as though they were. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You might as well go ahead and get ready for it because this building and this property is yours in Jesus' name. I want you to do more than clap your hands for it right now. That's what I'm talking about. I want you to show your faith in your praise. I want you to show your faith in your worship right now. And say, God, I believe it from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I don't wish bad on anybody. But God's going to have a church. And God's got people to save. And this building is going to be full to overflowing with people that are hungry for a move of God in their soul and in their spirit. I'm just proclaiming it. Backsliders are coming home. Families are going to be reunited. Children are going to receive the Holy Ghost and be baptized in Jesus' name. You just need to thank God for it. Come on, somebody. Let your faith rise right now. I wish you'd shout just a little bit. 
I wish you'd jump just a little bit. I wish you'd say, God, I'm praising you in advance for the victory. On the authority of the word of God, I bind every spirit of doubt, fear, anxiety, and worry that's in this house or that would try to attack those that are part of this wonderful church. I pray for the leadership right now and I take authority over every force of the enemy that would try to discourage. I pray for the pastor and pastor's wife and everybody that helps them the head usher and hostess and Sunday school teachers. I pray for an apostolic move of the Holy Ghost, unprecedented in this place, God, like never before, because you're moving in ways you've never moved before. You're filling people in ways you've never filled before. And I proclaim victory, and I proclaim finances, and I proclaim lands, and I proclaim raises to the people of this congregation for the purpose of building the kingdom of God. I proclaim it in the name of Jesus. Is somebody proclaiming it with me right now? Come on, you have the Holy Ghost, just like anybody else ever had it. Why don't you start proclaiming victory? Proclaim it for your family right now. Proclaim it for your marriage right now. Proclaim it for the backsliders that need to come home right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, what I felt must have been right. Amen. Because there's a witness tonight in the house. And you are with me on that. Amen. Amen. Nona Freeman told my, da told my dad when he was pastoring, she came through. He asked her, after all the miracles and revival she had seen, how do you, what is the key to revival? And Nona Freeman said, Brother Elms, you spell revival like this, U-N-I-T-Y. When the church unifies, revival is a byproduct. Maybe we need to stop praying for revival as much and pray for unity. Because when they were all in one accord, in one place, The church started in unity, and the church will continue in unity, and when we get to heaven, we'll still be in unity. Amen. They were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and the Lord started his church with 3,120 people who were unified around the instruction of Jesus Christ. Oh, fist bump somebody and tell them, I'm glad to be in church with you tonight. Amen. Amen. I didn't say punch him. I said fist bump. Some of y'all said, man, this is my opportunity. I'm... Amen. Hey, we like to have a good time in the house of the Lord. It is, it is sacred. It is serious. But once you've established that, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I feel the joy of the Lord here tonight. I feel freedom. I feel liberty. I know you've been standing. I know I probably could have already preached my message in the amount of time I've taken leading up to it. But we're okay, aren't we? Yes. Amen. <clears throat> I want to begin with a question tonight. What does it really mean to be a Christian? What is at the heart of the Christian walk? We are leaving slowly leaving 2019 and we are about to take off into 2020 if the Lord tarries in the next few days, couple of weeks and revival and harvest and all the things that God has promised it's time for them to come to pass 
And a shift is happening in the apostolic movement. And those that want it are going to have it and they're going to do what it takes to get it. Sadly, there are some churches that don't seem to have any idea what day and age they're living in. But I don't feel that way about this church. I have a feeling you're going to be a part of that shift. And God's going to say, I trust you with some new people. I trust you with harvest and revival. What a compliment from God for him to put new souls in a church. Because he trusts the church with new people. New people that don't look like maybe you look. I don't talk maybe like you talk. What a compliment. And God is ready to trust this church with a lot of brand new people. Amen. What does it really mean then, moving into 2020? What is a key that we need in order to see God do those things? It might surprise you tonight. Amen. And I want to talk to you about it. Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Let me, hur let me read hurriedly. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to, to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were called Christians, were first called Christians in Antioch. The New Living Translation says... The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That is my title tonight for this message. Christians first in Antioch. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, Christians first in Antioch. And then tell them, I want to be a real Christian. Because the world's not looking for fake Christianity. They see it every day. They're looking for a church of real Christians. Amen. 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 God bless you as you're seated. Thank you, Lord, for your word imparted to our hearts and minds and spirits in Jesus' name. Amen. Why weren't they called Christians first in Jerusalem? Why weren't they called Christians first in the most important city probably in the entire world? Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. The place that so many religions claim is their home. Yet we know it is only truly the home to one group of people, Amen. the Jewish people. But it's also very important to the apostolic Christian world because that's where the first outpouring happened. All of this importance, Jesus is crucified there. He comes out of the tomb three days after three days. He's there in Jerusalem for scene of men for another 40 days. And then he ascends just outside the walls of the city from the Mount of Olives and he leaves them giving them instruction to go back where? To Jerusalem. Everywhere you look, it's Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem that David took the head of Goliath in a bloody bag and tossed it at the gates of the city and said, you're next. I'm coming for this Jebusite stronghold. And 14 years later, he took Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has been so important, but they were not. You would think out of all the cities that they should have been called Christians first. It should have been in the place where they were first filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. But they were not called Christians first in Jerusalem. Everybody shake your head and say, nope. Weren't called Christians first in Jerusalem. They were called Christians first in this place called Antioch. Which was not a place we know a whole lot about until later in the New Testament. Because there was nothing, there was no church there. There were no Christians there. For a very long time. And so. After all of those important things. They were not called Christians. In Jerusalem. Marianne Williamson. A speaker and author said. Forgiveness is not always easy. At times it feels more painful. Than the wound we suffered. To forgive the one. That inflicted it. 
And yet, there is no peace without forgiveness. There is no peace without forgiveness. Mahatma Gandhi made this quote. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Lewis Smedes said, To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. I like that one. To forgive is to set a prisoner free only to discover that the prisoner all the while was yourself. And then there's an old Eskimo proverb. And I didn't ride a train and then get on a snowmobile and go to the North Pole and live in an, in an igloo hut to find this proverb I just got on Google. But this is what this old Eskimo proverb says. The circles of revenge form a chain. You can only break the circles of revenge through forgiveness. You can only break the chains, in other words, of revenge, of hatred, of bitterness, through one thing, forgiveness. Now, these are not people that are all, that, that are well known as Christian people. They do good in the world and did good in the world, but they all agree that forgiveness is the key to dealing with these feelings of bitterness and when we're hurt and when bad things happen to us and, and there's anger, when we're trying to find peace, they all agree that it is forgiveness that is the answer to all of these things. Nick Ute was a Vietnamese American photographer for the Associated Press during the Vietnam War. And on June the 8th, 1972, Nick was told that the Viet Cong, and I think we've got a picture of him um, um, there holding his camera, was uh, on June 8th, 1972, was told that the Viet Cong were about 20 miles west of his position. And he heard some soldiers were going to go check it out. And so Nick grabbed his camera and decided to go along. U.S. planes had already begun to bomb the village where they believed the Viet Cong were. And while they, his platoon he was with, were firing bullets, he pulled his camera and started firing pictures and started capturing what was going on. Smoke was coming up from that village. People were on fire. People were lying dead. Soldiers were lying dead. And the reason is U.S. planes had begun bombing that village with something that we know as napalm. Napalm is a burning, searing jelly that when the bomb explodes, it goes everywhere. And everything it touches begins to burn. No matter what it is, it is no respecter of material or persons. Your skin will burn, your clothes will burn, trees burn down, even it will catch metal on fire and burn holes through many kinds of metal. It is a very terrible thing that incinerates pretty much everything that it touched touches. And as Nick watched and he's snapping pictures, children began running toward him um, up the street from that village, as you can see on the screen, the smoke in the background. And in 1973, Nick won the Pulitzer Prize for this picture you've probably seen before, but it's known and called and entitled The Terror of War, a photo taken of Kim Fu and her cousins running away from that burning village that day. Nick said he wondered why Kim, the little girl in the front not wearing any clothes, he wondered as she got closer to him why she was not wearing any clothes. And then as she got closer to him, he saw the burns all over her body and her back and her arms. And he realized as she ran by him screaming, my skin is on fire. 
My skin is on fire. My skin is on fire. He understood that she had ripped the clothes from her body to get away from the burning sensation of that napalm that had landed on her. Nick put his camera down. He scooped Kim up, loaded her up in the nearest Jeep and raced her 40 minutes to the nearest field hospital to get her help while she screamed in agony and pain from the burns the whole time. He got her help and he visited her every day while he was there in that area. And when he visited, he would stay with her and he made sure that Kim received the care that she needed. To this day, Nick and Kim are close friends and they visit one another on a regular basis. Nick saved Kim's life and he, as a result, is a friend of hers to this day. Aren't you glad somebody reached down to you when you were in a bad situation, when you thought it was over, when you thought there's no hope for me, when you thought the addiction had you beat, Brother Garcia? I remember what you told us. Took enough drugs to kill a horse. The Filipinos didn't know quite what to do with enough. Why would you kill a horse? He said, he said, I took enough drugs, shot them up in my body to kill a horse. And the Filipinos were like, why would you give drugs to kill a horse? In their dialect, they didn't quite get it. And so they had to get a different interpreter to tell them he took enough drugs. The doctor said that should kill him. That's what he was saying. But literally it would have killed a horse. But aren't you glad for the Garcia? That in that moment when you thought it was over, not just you, but people in this church, everybody here that's been delivered from something, everybody here that's been saved from something, aren't you glad there was somebody nearby that said, I've got the care you need. I've got the forgiveness you need. I've got the deliverance you need. Ah, thank you, Lord, for your saving power, for your delivering power, and thank God for the church the considerate, the compassionate people of God that reached down to where we were and said, I'll care for you when nobody else. I'll clothe you when nobody else will. I'll give you food when nobody else will. I'll teach you about Jesus when nobody else will. Oh, somebody say thank you, Jesus. Matthew 18, 21 through 22 said, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Let me say it the way I think Peter really said it. Let's start over. Then, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, I'm aggravated. How often can my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him. Now, Peter being the soft-spoken, timid, calm, you know better than that. He spoke what was on his mind, no matter what it was. And yet he still preached the salvation message on the day of, hey, there's hope for everybody. But I think, I think this had actually happened to Peter. I don't think this was a deep theological question. Lord, how often? I've just been pondering as I sipped my white chocolate mocha from Starbucks. Can I get a witness? No, I think Peter had somebody that he considered a brother, somebody close. That continued to offend him. And he had an honest question. How often is this going to go on? How long is this going to happen? And, and how often do I. How long do I have to keep forgiving him? And if it were me. Asking the Lord. Who was God in flesh. Who was walking on the earth. He spoke into existence. Who was walking in the warmth of his own sunshine. I think if I asked the Lord a question, I would be quiet and let the God of glory answer. But not Peter. 
He said, I'm going to go ahead and take a guess at it, Jesus. Till seven times. So I think Peter had forgiven this person seven times, and he had had it up to here. And he was done. I don't want to forgive anymore. I think seven times is enough. And Jesus saith unto him, verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times. Yay! It's less. It's probably less than seven. I've done really good. I've gone above and beyond the call of duty. Pin the medal on my lapel. And the Lord just shook his head and chuckled. No, Peter, you're way off, buddy. Let me tell you how often. Until seven times, no, 70 times seven. Now, you can pull your smartphone device, whatever, out and start doing the math. I'll tell you what it is, 490. So you're telling me, Lord, I've got to count for all the way to 490. At the end of 490, I don't have to forgive him anymore. No, that's not what it means at all. When you study into what Jesus was saying, Jesus was saying, Peter, it's not about how many times you're offended. It's not about how many times you're hurt. It's about how many times you maintain a spirit of forgiveness toward that person. So, Peter, what I'm telling you is, forget the number. Every single time you are offended, even if it's the same person over and over and over, you need to forgive them because your soul needs to be saved. And it matters what kind of a spirit you have. And it matters whether you are going to follow me or not. What kind of a spirit you have about you. So, Peter, you need to forgive them every single time. Church, it does not matter how often someone offends or hurts us or what's happened in our life. What matters most is that we get the spirit of forgiveness inside of us that says, it doesn't matter what you say about me or what you do against me or how you try to hurt me. I'm just going to forgive you every single time. You know why? Because that's the best way to fight the enemy. The enemy can't get a foothold in your life if you're forgiving people over and over and over again. You want to see revival? Forgive. You want to have harvest? Maintain a spirit of forgiveness. Can somebody lift up the name of the one that forgave you? Hallelujah. His name was Saul before he was the great writer and apostle Paul of the New Testament. Before the Paul we know ever proclaimed the gospel, he was Saul and his message was persecution. Is this mine? It is now. Before he ever proclaimed the gospel, his name was Saul, and this was his message, persecution of the church. The people that spoke and prayed and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In short, he had the backing of the Sanhedrin, and he had the backing of Rome. And he was both Jew and Greek, which made him very popular among both sides of the aisle. And they used him to go after these people. And Saul believed what he was doing was the right thing. He had learned at the feet of the greatest teacher of Judaism of his day, Gamaliel. And everything he had been taught went against the, the, these, these, these people, these Jesus named people. It went against what he was taught and had been taught. I, I, I read where one theologian said, if Paul was alive today. He would have nine doctorate degrees in Jewish theology and the law of Moses. He was not just some guy they let loose like a, like a, like a mean rabid dog. 
He knew his stuff. He knew the law. He knew the political ramifications. This was an all-out war against these Jesus-named people. And so before he ever spoke the name of Jesus over somebody, he persecuted them. And he came after them with all of his combined knowledge. And with all of the support, he came after them. The Bible tells us that he wreaked havoc on these early believers and followers of Jesus. At Saul's hand, many were physically drugged from their homes and they were beaten, some of them, until they were crippled and couldn't walk straight or couldn't walk at all for the rest of their life. Others were thrown in prisons. Families were broken up. Husbands and wives were estranged because of the persecution. One would die and one would remain alive. Children lost parents and families lost grandparents. Wild animals that were starved in arenas were let loose on the people of God, all at the hand of Saul. Saul would go to the synagogue and he would get lists of these people and he would go find them. As a result, the people of God in Jerusalem began to run in every possible direction they could to get away from Saul. They left their homes, they left their jobs, they left their lives, they left their history, they left their 401ks. They loved Jesus, but they were getting out of Dodge. And it was in the plan of God, because everywhere they went, revival started. Everywhere they stop, even to get a drink, somebody's being baptized. Somebody's receiving the Holy Ghost. Somebody's being healed. And you know what? It's still the same today. Every time we come together, all of these things should be happening. Because we still call on the name that's higher than every other name. The name of Jesus cannot be defeated, will not be defeated. His word is forever settled in heaven. They could burn every Bible in the whole world, but his word would still be proclaimed around this world. So, they all fled. They all left. They got the kids. They got their adopted kids. They got... They got friends and, and hear all these. You got to think about the story. You got to think about the reality that there's a dad in prison and they just buried a mom because they found her praying in Jesus' name. And so the grandparents now are taking care of the kids and they're headed out of town to a place they don't even know where they're going. Just get away from Saul. They stoned Stephen and wow. They're stoning him. Saul's holding their coats. And while they yet are burying the apostle Stephen, Saul is wreaking havoc on the church. He does not even care for these people. So here they go. Let's get out of here. Some are on foot. Most are probably on foot. If they had a little bit more money, maybe they had a little burrow or a donkey. To carry a few supplies, you know, you got to have your Diet Cokes and, and, and your Nestle bottled water. You know, you got to have your, your stuff, right? And, you know, if you had a little bit more money, maybe they had a horse. You'd rather have a horse than a donkey. They're a lot less annoying and a lot faster. But if you had a little bit more money, Brother Garcia, maybe you could afford a one-humped camel. And if you had a lot of money, you could afford a two-humped camel because they hold twice the amount of water. I have no idea what I'm talking about right now. I just imagine it'd be more comfortable to ride a two-humped camel than it would a one-humped camel. So I think they charge more at the dealership. I don't know. I'm just in my mind putting all this together. They're just getting out as quickly as they can. And the Bible says, as they're fleeing away from Saul's persecution, one of the place, places they end up at is a town 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Now, that's a pretty long ways in a car. But if you're on foot, it's a very long journey. They finally got to this city called Antioch, and they stopped. 
We read later about Antioch having mighty revival, about a great church in Antioch sending out missionaries, sending out evangelists. I mean, incredible things are happening later in the New Testament in Antioch. But you need to understand the only reason there's a church there is because these people are refugees of Saul's persecution. They didn't have a district board meeting in Jerusalem and say, let's put our money together and let's go start a church in Antioch. And let's go send so-and-so up there to start this church. And this is the plan they're going to make. You know, they, it was not planned. The only reason there was ever a revival church in Antioch is because people, apostolics, ran from Saul's persecution. And they end up in Antioch after 300 miles. And somebody says, that's it. I'm not going any further. 300 miles is far enough. We almost lost granny back there. We need to just stop and we need to start our life. He's not going to find us up here. We're far enough away. There's not Facebook. There's not smartphones. It would take forever for him to find out where we are. And they stopped in Antioch. And I would imagine, as apostolics do, it didn't take long after they got their bearings that somebody said, why don't we have a prayer meeting and why don't we thank God for helping us to get up here to Antioch. Let's pray for those that are back in prison in Jerusalem. Let's pray for the families of those that have lost their loved ones because of Saul's persecution. And they started praying and they started meeting people in Antioch and they started telling them why they're there. And then they started teaching Bible studies. They started praying for people in Jesus name. They started started baptizing people in Jesus' name. Signs and wonders and miracles and blind eyes. The dead are being raised. All of a sudden, something is happening in Antioch. God is pouring out his spirit through these apostolic Jesus' name believers. Are you still with me? I'm hurrying. So they hear about it in Jerusalem. The disciples and apostles hear about it and they said we need to send somebody up to Antioch to, to see what's going on and report back to us what God is doing in Antioch. So they send Barnabas, consequently whose name means son of consolation. And they send the son of consolation up to Antioch to these refugees who are mourning the loss of their families and what all's happened to cause them to end up 300 miles away from home in a place they're unfamiliar with, starting their lives over. Here comes Barnabas, and there's miracles, and there's signs, and there's wonders, and it's happening, and Barnabas' eyes are that big, and all of a sudden, Barnabas becomes the first pastor of the church in Antioch. And he starts organizing everything. And he starts finding out who can sing and who can play, who can lead prayer. And he starts bringing order to this new body of believers that are now in Antioch. And revival is happening. And harvest is happening. It's all taking place. The dead are being raised. It's all happening, Brother Fuquay. As the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall I'll cast out devils in my name. It's happening in Whittier. It's happening in 2019, and it's going to happen more in 2020. God is moving just like he did back then. But he said, greater things than these shall you do. You're getting ready to see greater things. You're getting ready to see greater things. You're getting ready for God to use you for greater things. God's going to lead you to people in government. And God's going to start turning people in politics around for the name of Jesus. Right here in Southern. I speak it in Jesus' name. Right here in Southern California. Oh, if you believe it with me right now, give God a shout of praise. Woo! I'm 
Get ready, Brother Garcia, because you're going to get a call from the Capitol, and you're going to get in there and start praying over some stuff. Because there's great faith in that man and his wife. And God uses people with great faith. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Can somebody praise God again right now? There's something. Woo! Do you feel it? I hear the sound of abundance of rain. I see a cloud that used to be the size of a man's hand, but it's filling the sky and souls are about to pour out of it and miracles and apostolic authority is about to pour out of it. I'm just telling you right now, if you'll get them here, they'll receive the Holy Ghost. I said, if you'll get them here, they'll receive the Holy Ghost. If you'll just get them here, God will do the rest of the work. Just get them here. So, that's what they're doing in Antioch. Unbelievable. And Brother Barnabas steps up to the pulpit one Sunday, and he says, Ain't God good, church? And the church goes, yeah. They're going nuts in Antioch. He said, I'm going to leave for a couple weeks, but I'll be back. So I'm going to leave Brother Herkimer in charge of the prayer request. And I'm going to leave Brother so-and-so and and Sister so-and-so in charge. You know how pastor does. You do this and this and this and this while I'm gone. Isn't it amazing how many people have to cover for one man? That's the kind of power God gives to the pastor. Amen. And so he did that, and they were all said, oh, pastor's leaving. Pastor's leaving. But Barnabas said, you guys just carry on. Keep working. Keep seeing God work. And so they did. A couple weeks later, they hear Barnabas is coming home. Pastor Barnabas is coming back. How many of you love it when pastor comes back from being gone, like to the Philippines? Yeah, who doesn't? That's God's man in your life for this church. There's a special connection. So there's nothing like when pastor comes home. But thank you for letting him go. Because he and his wife will be better leaders if you'll give them time off every now and then. Whether they act like it or not, they're glad when you get a vacation every now and then because you're easier to pastor when you get home. I can say that. He can't say that. I'm the evangelist. I leave tomorrow. Nothing like when pastor, so here comes Pastor Barnabas. They hear he's coming home. They've got the music going. You know, it's, it's the fast song. I don't know what a fast song is. I'm trying to think right now. Some fast song. But fast song, fast song, fast song, fast song, fast song. And the drummer's going. And, and, and they see the door open. And, and he's about to be back. And the, the drummer speeds up. And he, and, and he drops a stick when Pastor Barney, Bar- Barnabas walks back in. And the bass player breaks a string on the bass. I know I'm being overboard. Just, just go with it. Just, just let me enjoy this story. And so they're excited, and Pastor Barnabas walks in. Pastor's home, and they're all clapping, and there's smiles on their faces. But there's a problem. Walking in behind him. They're not too excited about this next guy. Because the next guy is not Peter. is not John. It's not James not somebody they would like to see walk in behind Pastor Barnabas. It's the man who is the reason why 
they're even in Antioch to begin with. It's Saul. And I think at that point, I think the song, the piano player was playing along and it went. I think the praise singers dropped the mics. And I think everybody smiles. And I think everybody is immediately shocked. And the pastor they were so excited to see walk in the door. Now they're wondering, what's wrong with our pastor? What in the world did he bring Saul here for? Doesn't Pastor Barnabas know why we're here to begin with? Does he remember the funerals we attended? Our family members that are in prison? Does he see brother so-and-so that's laying crippled in the aisle? We have to bring him to church on a stretcher because of a beating he received. What in the world is going on right now? I'm sorry, but I just think there were thoughts and emotions that began to run through the congregation's minds in their lives when they start remembering what not too long ago happened in Jerusalem. You know why? Because they're people just like we are. And I know this, God knew what was ahead for Antioch if they could pass this test. Let's have church. Let's see God do, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Let's see God do incredible things. But I just believe God has something so great in store for this church. You can't even begin to imagine what God is about to do in this church specifically and the church worldwide. But I'm talking about Whittier, California. I'm talking about right here, right now, through your pastor, through this leadership, through you and your family. You need to get ready. But if you're gonna get there, God knows how to test you. And God wanted to know if they could forgive the man that had hurt them, that had killed them, that had ripped parents away from children. I believe they were called Christians first in Antioch because that's where they had to learn the lesson of forgiveness. They, it couldn't happen in Jerusalem. It had to happen with people that came face to face with the man that almost destroyed them. Can you forgive the man that crippled you? Can you forgive the man that ripped your family apart? Can you forgive the man that caused you to have to go to the funeral of your mother? And I think some people started missing church over it. Because I know people. Who wants to go to a church that every time you walk in the door, you're reminded of a terrible past. Amen. We have the ability to remember when God forgets. Oh, God. So here goes Pastor Barnabas knocking on people's doors. Why did you miss church? What's going on? Is somebody sick? 
all the things going through his mind. And they're saying, we can't come back. We can't come back. How can we come back to a church where Saul is on the platform every service? How can we come back when we're looking in the face of a man who did everything? You know what he did to us. Why would you expect us to come back? We think we can just... We think we can just watch church online somewhere. It's not wrong to watch church online. I do it all the time. But I don't miss church to watch church online. We think we can just open our Bibles and we can have a little small group right here of people that feel the same way we do. And we don't. We think we can just handle it, Pastor Barnabas. Small groups are great. But not when they're formed out of bitterness. Pastor Barnabas said, oh, no. Uh-uh. No. Let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to come back to church. And you're going to sit in those pews. And you're going to lift your hands. And you're going to worship God while you're looking at the man who did all of that stuff to you. How can we do that? Oh, you must not have heard. While you've been up here seeing miracle signs and wonders, God's been doing some things down Jerusalem way. Saul was on his way to Damascus. God knocked him off of his horse, his high horse. Struck him blind as a bat. Yes, he deserved it. And then God told him to go to a house on Straight Street. See, that's what happens when God comes into your life. He straightens you out. He puts you on Straight Street. And you remember Brother Ananias? Yeah, God told him to go to that house and to pray for Saul. Well, Ananias probably didn't do it. Because he knows Saul just like we do. Sorry, you're wrong. Ananias did what God told him to do. He went into the house. He laid hands on Saul. Saul began to ask God to forgive him of all of his sins and all the stuff he's done against these, the apostolic movement, the church. And, 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 and then God opened his eyes so he could see after three days of being blind. I don't believe it. That killer... That murderer, you're saying the Lord forgave him? You're saying the Lord filled him with the same Holy Ghost we received on the day of Pentecost? Yeah, well, they probably didn't baptize him in Jesus' name. Oh, it's not over yet, Pastor Barnabas said. He went, and the disciples, they wondered a lot of the same things that you're wondering right now. But ultimately, they baptized Saul in Jesus' name. You mean they baptized him the same way we were baptized? Yeah. So what I'm telling you is, as your pastor, if the one that forgave you and filled you and gave you his name in baptism, if you're going to be like him and you've taken on his name and you've said you're a going to be Christ-like now and you're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. What I'm telling you is your God and Savior Jesus Christ forgave Saul and filled him just like he filled you. Not only that, but the Lord called him to preach and you better be at church Sunday because Paul's preaching. I'm here to tell you in the Holy Ghost right now that our next great revival is going to come from a spirit of true Christianity. And that is a spirit of forgiveness. It's time to let some things go. 
It's time to let God forgive people just like he forgave us. It's time to let bygones be bygones. Let the backslider come home. Let God do a work in our family. It's time to forgive and be forgiven. It's time for marriages to come back together. It's time for relationships to heal. And it's time to let God be the judge and let God do a work in our churches. I wish somebody would let a true spirit of Christianity come over your life and heart right now. Musicians and singers, come up, come up, come up. I got, I'm, the Holy Ghost is moving. I'm trying to hurry. The Holy Ghost is moving. Something special is happening in this church. The Bible said as the son was walking back home to father's house, not knowing if he would even be accepted. The one who basically had told his father, I wish you were dead. By saying, I want my inheritance, he was saying, I wish you were dead. Because you only get an inheritance after your father dies. But it says of the father, when he saw his son afar off. You know, here's what we do. God forgive us. We don't all do it. I'm not going to stereotype everybody. But here's what we tend to do sometimes. We see them coming. Let's see if they make it to the front yard, Brother Garcia. If they get to the front yard, we'll consider the porch. They get to the porch. What is it about six months that's the magic number? Six months. Let's see if they can hang out on the porch. After all, look what they did to us so many years ago. Look what they said about us. Look how they wasted what they were given at Father's house. And if they can hang out on the porch long enough and prove that they're here to stay, then we'll let them in the house. I'm sorry, folks. That's not what Jesus said the Father did. And he was speaking of himself. And he was speaking of the church. And he was speaking of, of us as individuals when he said, when the Father saw him afar off, which means he had been watching every day for his son's return, anticipating him coming back and making himself right with the Father so he could be a part of the. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people that have walked away from God, but God knows where they are right now. And they've learned a lot of lessons since they walked away. And when they come back, they're going to be stronger. They're going to be better. They're going to do more for the kingdom of God than they could have ever done before. If we'll just run, the Bible says the father ran to meet his son when he was yet afar off. And he put a robe and he put a ring of authority on his hand and gave him new shoes and said, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a great time because my son who was lost has come back home. It's time to let the lost come home. It's time to let the sinner come in. It's time to say, we're no better than you without the grace of God. Let us help you. Let's get in here. Let's work for the kingdom of God. So remember, remember the photographer at the beginning of my message, Nick? Little did he know what would happen to Kim. Little girl he saved after he had left Vietnam so many years ago. Little did he know that as Kim grew up into adulthood that through her teenage years she went through surgery after surgery, skin graft after skin graft, over and over until she lay in her bed one day and considered taking her own life. When she pulled the drawer open next to her bed and in the drawer was a New Testament. 
And she started reading the words of the New Testament. She had never read it before. And she started reading about this man, this healer named Jesus. And she compared his teachings to her teachings growing up. And the more she read the New Testament, the more she fell in love with the words in the New Testament. And it kept her from taking her own life. And it did such a work in her that she grew up and became an inspirational speaker and moved to the United States. And I don't know if she's still doing it or not, but she used to travel all over the place telling how that the doctors had said they could not do anything else for her body from the wounds and the pain she had suffered. But Jesus had healed the wounds on the inside of her. It gets better while she's giving one of her inspirational speeches to a group of veterans on Veterans Day a few years ago, telling about all of this. She said, if I could talk to the man who caused the pain in my life, who caused me to have to go through all of the surgeries, all of the ridicule as a child that I received, all the emotional trauma, all this stuff. If I could talk to the man now, here's what I would tell him. I would tell him, you can't go back. You can't change history. All you can do is move forward. While she's saying this, that man was sitting in the audience. His name was Jim Plummer. And he had wondered for some 50 years if he had been the one who had given the okay for the attack on Kim's village back in Vietnam. And now Kim is talking in front of him. And he scrolls out on a piece of paper and a pen, Kim, I am that man. And he sends it up to her. And she reads it. And when she reads it, she says, whoever wrote this note, come up here on the platform with me. Please, whoever you are, will you please get up and come up here with me on the platform. Slowly, Jim Plummer rose up, Brother Garcia, and his shoulders were shaking, and his tears were falling before every step. And with every step, they heard Jim Plummer saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But every time he said, I'm so sorry, they heard Kim reply, I forgive you. I'm so sorry. I forgive you. I'm so sorry. I forgive you. All the way to the platform. And when Jim got to the platform, Kim opened her arms and she hugged Jim Plummer. And Jim wept on Kim's shoulder. And now, Kim and Jim are best of friends because of the power of forgiveness. Somebody needs to forgive tonight. Do you want this church to be known as a true Christian church? Then let it be said of Word of Flame Ministries, that is a true Christian church because they have the spirit of forgiveness. They have the true spirit of Jesus Christ. They forgave me when I was wrong and now I'm part of the family. Thank you, thank you for being faithful to church. But that is not what makes us Christians. Thank you for being giving and returning tithe and supporting. That's not the definition of a true Christian. That's not what's at the heart. Thank you for living in such a way that it represents God modesty and separation thank you for everything that you do but i think we have called that christianity when it's not i'll tell you what christianity is it's when a man with nails through his hands and his feet so mutilated and scarred that nobody that knew him even recognized him cracked his eyes open through the blood that had dried on his eyelids and looks down at those before he takes his last breath and says it's finished 
and he looks at them and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's why he came. That's what his visit to this earth for 33 years was all about. You want to know what it means to be a Christian? Go to the moment when he could have called 10,000 angels. Go to the moment when he could have cursed the entire earth. But he looked at them and he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. If he hadn't done that, you and I wouldn't be standing right now in Whittier, California. But it's because of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness that we're here right now. Thank you for everything you do. But do you have the heart of Jesus Christ? Are you truly a Christian? Are you someone that can forgive? Let's stand. These altars are open. You need to get up here as quickly as you possibly can. This church is headed somewhere, but somebody needs to forgive. Somebody needs to say, I'm sorry. Somebody needs to let bitterness go. Somebody needs to end this year and move into the new year. Having forgiven somebody that hurt you. I'm sorry about what happened to you so many years ago. I'm sorry you were abused by somebody. I'm sorry someone talked against you and tried to ruin your reputation. But the fact is, we can't go back. We can't change it. But we can let God do such a work in us that we heal through forgiveness.